So yeah, my name's uh, Jim Katsafolis. Um, I've probably been a silent member, like many, of the ASV for a few years, and more re recently decided to get involved. So um, I'm the editor of the yearbook for uh, at least for now, and uh, I assume I'll, I'll keep going after this year. But uh, it is a bit of work, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to to get involved, it's probably a good way to dive in and get involved for, with a society. Uh, the talk I'm going to do today is on backyard suburban astronomy. And I guess for the last, oh, it must be a good 10, 15 years, I've been playing a bit with taking lots of photos of the planets through telescopes and more recently using uh, webcams, which have become very popular um, with that type of uh, astrophotography. And uh, I thought it'd be nice to share some of my experiences, some of my uh, images, and maybe also get some feedback. And, and I've even started to dabble a little bit in deep sky imaging. Still very much a beginner on that, but maybe, maybe it's time to talk to the uh, astrophotography group and get, get some more ideas. So we'll can we have the lights down? Thanks, and start the talk. OK, just as a summary, um, after a brief introduction, I'll go through the equipment that I use. Obviously, everyone's got different uh, telescopes, different equipment. Uh, I think what I've got is fairly uh, common amongst many people. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about planetary photography and why webcams are important in this area. And then I thought, uh, because uh, Processing the images is so important. I thought it'd be a good idea to look at one of the, the more popular free software packages that you can get on, on the internet, Registax, which is used by a lot of people who, who use webcams to do uh, imaging. And probably the best way to, to show Registax is to actually open some of uh, a couple of my uh, video files, because that's the way it works. You, you take a, an AVI file or a video of your, your object and then you read it into Registax and do a bit of processing. And just to finish off, I thought I'd show that you, you can even do some deep sky stuff from um, the suburbs because th this talk is about doing all this stuff in, in the less than ideal conditions you have when you live near a big city such as Melbourne. Um, so we'll just get going. So I guess astronomy in the suburbs Obviously, you're going to be limited to the more or, or the brighter objects. And obviously, the planets have got plenty of uh, light uh, when using uh, any optical aids, whether it's uh, even, even visually with, with your eyes or whether it's binoculars or, or small or large telescopes. And of course, there are some other objects, the, the brighter uh, deep sky objects such as the Orion Nebula or the... Um, Keyhole Nebula, there's a, whole, there's a whole range of them that even though there are a few challenges, you can still um, take some good images of. And what are the challenges? Obviously, some of the challenges are the same as they are for all astronomers who observe. The biggest one, of course, is atmospheric turbulence. And uh, I think that battery's dying. But it's all right. And with the uh, atmospheric turbulence, it's, it's pretty much the biggest killer, really, for um, anyone observing anything from Earth out into space. And what that means is the air is not empty. Um, the atmosphere is full of all sorts of different molecules, uh, gases and so forth, and even particles. Uh, some are naturally occurring, some are uh, related to pollution. And what that does is it actually uh, distorts the image when you're looking at it. So, you know, many astronomers describe it as looking at the sky or looking from underneath the bottom of a swimming pool and looking out to see what's out there. So that's probably a good analogy. And what I'll do just to show, to visually show you that effect, I'll open one of my AVI files and what this will show you is live what it looks like when you're recording through the telescope. So this is through an 8-inch Schmidt-Cassegrain using a webcam and you can see 
what the effect the atmosphere has. Now, if you wanted to do just a straight exposure, uh, and obviously the moon's fairly bright, so you'll get away with a very short exposure, but when you move to one of the planets which won't have as much light, one of the problems you're going to get is over a period of time, you'll record all that information, all that distortion. And what I'll do, I'll just play it again and then just show this effect here where I'll pause it and then just continuously move along. You can see at the moment this particular frame, it's recorded about 15 frames per second, looks fairly distorted. But if I keep moving every now and then, probably not going to get it. Every now and then you'll, you'll come across a frame that has better conditions. If you just focus on one of the craters, every now and then one of the features pops up. So for example here, you can see that feature coming and going th through different frames. So the idea with webcams is if we collect hundreds, even thousands of frames, you can then use software to, to, to go through the frames, pick the best ones and only make your final image using your best frame. So in a sense you want to beat the seeing effects or the seeing uh, challenges or this atmospheric turbulence. Um, I'll just show one more. Here's a picture of Saturn which I'll, I'll process later. I better get this guy out of the way. And you can see a similar thing going on. You can see a bit of movement. Some of that will be possibly the, uh, the gear, you know, there might be a little bit of wind, but some of that is actually due to the atmosphere. And there might be also some movement due to non-ideal alignment of the telescope or non-ideal tracking. Uh, I'm not using any auto-guiding for this particular thing, so there will be some error in, in the tracking of the, uh, the telescope or the mount. So that, that sort of describes the challenge. If we now move back to the presentation. So that's really the biggest challenge and what I've found, um, especially in the suburbs, is if you want to start to reduce the amount of atmospheric turbulence, you want to start looking at uh, objects which are above around the 35 degree elevation mark. Anything lower than that, the um, atmospheric turbulence is quite severe. You can still, if, it, if the object's bright enough, get some good images, but you'll get the optimal results as obviously as the object moves higher in the sky. Uh, obviously light pollution, anyone living near a big city, that's always going to be a, a big challenge. There are ways to get around that. Um, or to actually improve, at least improve your results. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. As far as deep sky goes, it's, it's very detrimental. Um, two reasons, obviously one is there's just too much glow in the background, so you're not going to get a very good long exposure anyway, which is what you need for deep sky imaging. And the other thing is finding the target, finding a, a, a target that's doesn't have a high magnitude or a high brightness, sorry, uh, is very difficult. Sometimes I've given up, I've, I'm, I'm looking for something very faint, but because there's too much light pollution, you, you just can't find it. Um, as you're searching or star hopping or whatever you're doing. Uh, rising heat from houses and, and buildings in the neighbourhood, especially in the winter, everyone's got their heaters on, that adds to the turbulence effects. Chimney smoke, sometimes, some people still use chimney. I also had a problem with bats. You might be wondering, what's this about bats? Uh, I live about eight kilometres or five miles north to northeast, so it's in the Darabin area, around the Northgate area. And uh, there's a lot of bats that were moved from actually here, from the Botanical Gardens many years ago, to the Ivanhoe sort of uh, area near, near the river there. And yeah, during the summer especially, there's lots of bats flying around at dusk and they seem to be attracted to the, the buzzing of the Mead telescope when, <laughs> when it's trying to uh, tell you, yeah, it's found an object or you know, go to the next step. So I had to turn that on. I had bats coming in quite close 
to me, even to the point where I could feel the, uh, the air from their wings. Um, took me a while to work it out, but when I switched off, the, uh, they're pretty inquisitive. And they're not real bats, they're the uh, flying foxes. So there's no real danger there. Okay, so this also, I thought this is a good way to illustrate the limitations you have in the suburbs. So this is from my backyard looking south. So you can see the south celestial pole uh, just a bit above the centre. The city is a little bit to the right from where my house is situated. So the light pollution would get even worse as you moved to the right. Um, now what I did here was just a star trail. I was doing a project years ago when I was going through the um, astronomy course and one of them was to, to look at star trails and, and compare different conditions, different you know, film versus uh, digital photography. This is a, obviously using a DSLR and what I did was I um, put together 60 30 second exposures and what I found is um, the limiting magnitude by trying to find the dimmest star in that image is about four. That's about the best the camera could see. And you know, the camera should, is, should be capable of much better than that, especially when you crank up the sensitivity. Uh, and I found playing around with these figures didn't really change that limit. If you make it more sensitive and reduce the exposure, you, because it's more sensitive, you're actually um, I guess exposing much faster anyway. So you're not going to achieve that much improvement by trying to play around with these uh, without using a filter maybe. And then as an example, this one, is it? Uh, I wasn't sure. Is it working? Okay, sorry about that. Okay. Um, and just to show you the difference in a dark sky site, this is at Anglesey, which is southwest, I guess, uh, just before you get to Warren. Um, here you can see uh, this is a, a this time 60 second exposure. Sorry, 30 second exposure. No, I've got that wrong. That's 30 60 second exposures. Uh, ISO speed is a bit higher, and uh, you can see you know, hundreds more stars in this trail and I tried to estimate the limiting magnitude. It's around seven, maybe even a little bit um, higher than that, somewhere between seven and eight. And um, you can see some of the color of the different stars. Down here, you've got um, the Southern Cross, I think is hiding behind these trees and you've got the two pointers here just to give you an idea of what's happening. I think it was in September 2007 when I did this probably around 9, 10 o'clock at night, but because, I mean, it's changed since then. Anglesey, unfortunately, has a lot more street lights. There's even been a battle between different parts of the neighbourhoods where some people want more street lights, other people want less. Um, but at that time, it was pretty dark. I couldn't, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. So just to give you an idea of the different conditions you have between the suburbs and the, um, a dark sky site. So to overcome the challenges, okay, atmospheric turbulence, like I said, use uh, preferably targets above the horizon. If you really want to look at something that's lower, that, well, you don't have any choice. Capturing as, as many short exposure frames as possible, and we're talking uh, in the rates of 15 to 20 or higher frames per second, basically, to give you an idea. So the, the webcams you use or the cameras you use have to be reasonably sensitive to be able to uh, take good um, frames with, with enough information on them. As far as light pollution goes, some of the problems I had was neighbours with garden lights, um, you know, lights that are attached to, to walls in and pointing into the, in, into the yard. Sometimes they leave them on, they forget them. Or, so sometimes talking to your neighbours, telling them what you're doing and saying, you know, you know if, you, if you're interested, come and have a look as well. Um, usually they, they cooperate, so it's, it's fairly good. I find observing later is better, past 11 o'clock. Most people have gone to bed. 
Um, most lights have been turned off, even house lights are off. Other things that can help, I haven't dabbled a lot with filters yet and that's something I want to look at, but juice shields can help because essentially they narrow, um, the, the, I guess, the stray light that can come in from the side. So although you may want to use them for what they're designed for, they also help cut out a little bit of the surrounding light. So my equipment, um, about eight years ago I bought a Mead LXD 55 8-inch Schmidt Cassegrain, which is fairly, I guess it's like having a, a Holden Kingswood these days, um, with, with the rate at which technology is moving. But you know, all the basics are there and you can, you can grab some really good images with it. Um, the things that are in yellow is really the minimum you need. You need some sort of telescope, you need a laptop for capturing and processing images, and a webcam. That's pretty much the minimum you need to be able to do some good photography. A lot of the other stuff I've acquired over time, you know, electronic focusing, I had to get heater straps for the winter because uh, I do get a lot of moisture build up if I don't use them. You know, filters, polarizers, a decent battery to keep the thing going. Uh, lots of different camera adapters. I started with some film camera and then moved on to a DSLR and I've also got a couple of CCD cameras which I want to start looking at more deep sky work when I get the time. I've got a Coronado solar telescope. Obviously if you never want to be affected by all these other problems. Um, you want to get into solar uh, astronomy, you'll never have a lot of these issues. You st you'll still have maybe a little bit of uh, turbulence. But obviously, as everyone or most people here would know, accessories cost a lot of money. I think I probably spent more on accessories than what the telescope cost me to begin with. So I thought I'd throw this one in. This was probably my best shot um, I think it was 2005, just before I bought my DSLR or even my webcam. I wish I had the webcam then. I used my film camera and I managed to get <coughs> this occultation of Jupiter just coming out from behind, behind the moon. I think its path was more something like this. Um, bit tricky to, to really get it right because as, as you know with film, anyone who's played with film, you're pretty blind, so you've got to bracket your exposures. You've got to take some shorter exposures, some longer. You've got to play around with film, and it takes a few days or a week or so to get the results, as well as having to argue with the film processing people who say there was rubbish on your film, so I threw it out. Usually you've got to say, please develop everything. But it's getting actually harder and harder to do this now for anyone who wants to keep using film. There's less and less places that'll do it. So just a few pictures of the equipment. Um, this is the typical setup. There's the webcam, little laptop. I've actually moved to something better now. Um, and yeah, the typical uh, Mead telescope, battery. I've got the little heater controller here. And you can pick up some really cheap kits if you want to build your own. And there's the straps. I know this looks a bit amateurish, but I found wrapping something around the tube helped keep it a little bit warmer uh, when it was really cold, although not up until this year we haven't had that many cold nights really. And uh, there's a couple of other photos. Here's just another shot. I'm using a music stand here to hold the laptop. Um, and that's the auto, or that's electronic focuser there. And I just threw this in because I'm going to show a couple of examples of uh, deep sky shots I've tried. What I did is I bought uh, the Orion uh, Star Shooter Auto Guider kit, I think it's called, and essentially mounted it side by side by using a rail because uh, I didn't want to mount it on top of the tube. You can get issues with flexure on the tube if you put too much weight on it. And because they're relative, to, fixed and relative to each other. If this guy um, is doing the guiding, then this guy is essentially being guided the same. So it all works out nicely. 
Okay, so what, why should we use webcams? Okay, number one, they're very low cost. Webcams are very popular in the whole internet industry. So anything that has a mass market is going to be cheap. Um, allows you to have high sensitivity, short exposure time. You can capture hundreds, even thousands per minute now these days. Allows you to get around this, the atmospheric turbulence issues. Can capture multiple images when the scene is momentarily good, and that's the key. Um, you hear of stories of, of people who will who are not doing any imaging, but they will sit there on the telescope for literally hours just to get those few minutes of good seeing uh, when they're looking at, it could be Jupiter, it could be in any, any object. Uh, and that's what you're trying to capture, just those split seconds when the atmospheric turbulence was on your side and then you can process those images later. You can get high resolution, colour, focus control and some, some nice free software to be able to process them very easily. And, it, and the software actually um, is very easy to use. You don't have to understand a lot about what's going on. Um, so in the early days, going back to sort of 2003 to, I don't know, 2006, um, a lot of the, the first few uh, webcams that were out were not designed for astronomy. But of course, uh, a lot of amateurs worked out very quickly that there was a two or three models that would do the job. Uh, the Philips TOU cams, there's a couple of versions there. They're, they've got the same CCD chip. They actually had a true silicon CCD detector in them. Not very high resolution, but the right specs to be able to do um, webcam astrophotography. And for quite a while, these were sort of very standard things. And then I guess Mead and some of the other companies started to get on board with some CD because the difference between these two, um, most cameras you would buy today, um, DSLRs, will have what's known as a CMOS silicon chip in it. Uh, a CCD chip, uh, which is what we're used to talking about when we talk about digital cameras, is actually not quite the same thing. A CCD chip is essentially an array of sensors that has to be read out and then that file has to be processed. With CMOS, um, there is a not so sensitive um, pixel on there and it could be colour, uh, but there's also a lot of processing electronics on the chip. So the advantage there is you can do a lot of processing on board and spit out a processed file, which is essentially your image. And these are much cheaper than the CCDs um, because of you know, the requirements for fabricating them. And I won't go into that too much detail, but what you'll find, anything that's got a CCD in it will be more expensive for the equivalent thing that's got just a, a normal CMOS detector. So the commercial market will use, in most cases, these. You can get some nice, expensive CCD-based DSLRs. I know Canon make a couple. Um, but in professional astronomy, um, they will use high-grade CCDs, which will literally cost hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, because of the, how pure they are and, and they don't have a lot of defects on them. Now, the important thing for a webcam is you need to be able to control, especially frame rate, brightness. These help. They're not absolutely necessary. And, uh, of course, the shutter speed is very important and the gain. If it's a CCD chip, it'll have a gain so you can increase its uh, sensitivity. And more recently, what's happened, uh, and as technology gets much cheaper, um, there are more coming out and you know, you've got Celestron and Mead and, and a couple of the other companies coming out with these nice five megapixel um, cameras. Uh, and you'll notice again, cost of CMOS, cost of a CCD. Now these are equal, but where you lose out is the resolution. 
So CMOS will allow you more resolution for the same price than the CCD does. But if you want higher resolution for a CCD, the price starts going up. So there's a bit of a, a trade-off there. Um, but I, I would even say any of these, this is a special one, this is more a scientific CCD camera, which I've tried. And it was nice and cheap for a nice, um, a nice resolution there. But having said that, any DSLR you have that can capture video will do the job as well. And there's more and more DSLRs now that will capture video. And as long as you can convert them into AVIs or MPEGs, uh, you should be able to use the processing software. So I won't spend too much time on this, I've already mentioned it, but yeah, you've got the C CCD versus CMOS. Um, you want to have all these different controls. This is important here. This, is, but this was an issue early on with computers where the USB, because they're USB based cameras, you needed some good speed to be able to drag all this data off the camera and store it on your hard disk. But these days with USB 2 and now USB 3, it gets over some of those challenges. Make sure you have an eyepiece adapter. You, most companies now will supply that and make sure you, know, you have the drivers for the right operating system. Some of those older ones, if you ever come across one, I found the old Philips webcams don't go past Windows XP, so you're stuck unless you get into virtual operating systems. And you can add other stuff, uh, easily put Barlow lenses if you want to try and increase the image size. So when it comes to processing um, webcam AVIs, what, what's an AVI? It's just a file of successive frames to form a video. And the pr processing that's required, number one, you need to select the best frames. And the software can do that by looking at what's called a signal to noise ratio of each frame. So how high is the light signal above the noise. The higher, the better. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much processing you do, if you don't start with a, with a set of frames that has enough information on it, you'll be limited by essentially how good the frames are. So there is a, a lower limit to how good your final outcome will be. Once you've selected the best frames, because there's movement, you know, there's seeing effects, Turbulence will move the image around. You might have alignment drift, wind, etc. You need to align each frame, and the software does that very nice. So it take each frame, uses alignment marks, and will align them so that when you get to the next step and you stack them, they'll all be nicely and perfectly aligned. What stacking does is just another way of saying averaging, really. Um, you're adding uh, one image on top of the other, you're adding all those pixels and then by essentially averaging out you get rid of a lot of the noise. Not all of it, but you'll get rid of a, a large amount of the noise by using the, the stacking technique. And then once you've stacked it, you do have a reasonable image, but then you can go further and see how can you highlight different details or features in the image. Some people used to jump straight to this type of process where you can, you can go into Photoshop and, and do all sorts of nice things. Um, but Registax, the reason I like it, it has this wavelets um, processing capability which allows you to do some pretty nice things. Now what's Registax? It's a free software package developed back in 2003 by a Dutch amateur astronomer called Beravoets. And why did he do it? He was trying to you know, do some planetary photography and, and there was no software there, so I thought, I'm going to write it. So he developed the software to process the AVI files, a line, another word for that is register, which is where he gets the name from, stack and then process them. And so it's become a bit of a standard for many amateur astronomers, mainly for planetary type imaging. And just before I go to a, a bit of a demo um, of uh, Registax, one of the unique features it has is these things called wavelets. And 
I, I don't want to go, there's a lot of maths behind the processing and even I am not on top of all of it. But put simply, what a wavelet is, it's a signal processing technique that will divide a, a digital image into a number of layers by using a series of filters. Now you're probably used to filtering light and filtering sound. When you filter an image, what you're actually doing is separating out different features. So a high frequency feature would be a fine feature where you get um, very quick changes in intensity as you move from pixel to pixel. A low frequency feature would be a, a broader, so if you're looking at someone's face, the, the, the whole shape of the face would be a low frequency feature, but a small, say, um, mole on the face would be a high, higher frequency feature. So it's the same idea with all images, and it's one of the main uses of wavelets is to be able to process images by just filtering them, coming up with a bank of filters, separating all those into different layers, adjusting just each layer separately, and when you recombine the image, you end up with something that has uh, features that are highlighted and makes them sharper. So I think the best way, instead of just talking about it, is actually to show um, Registax in action. So hopefully this all works fine. Just looking for Registax. I don't think it's running. Okay, I'll run Registax. So the latest version is I think 6.1, um, which came out I think a couple of years ago. I'm not sure if there's going to be any more, but it has changed quite a bit. Even though the basics are the same, it has changed quite a bit. Now when you look at Registax, it starts, you think, you know, what the hell's going on here? There's you know, it's lots of dials and, and sliders and things that would be enough to turn most people off. But the nice thing about Registax, it's been written in such a way that you only have to do a few simple clicks at the beginning if you're a beginner, and it'll just run through and do a default process. So what I'll do is I'll um, show an example. So we need to open a file. So I'll just go to the USB stick. This might slide it down slightly. Um, here we are. So I'll, I'll start with uh, that moonshot we were talking about. It might come up, you know, I haven't set it in colour and you can say yes. Yeah, so it's, it's got some, some nice smarts in it to help you along the way. The first thing you've got to do is, okay, we can see here we've got, it tells you how many frames you've got. You've got 333 frames. Um, in the whole image and the first thing we've got to do is align the best frames. Down here you've got a choice. You can say I want to only use the best, say 10%, uh, sorry, the best uh, frames, the best 10% frames or 20% or you can say the lowest quality of any frame can't go under 80% which I'll use Actually, I'll, I'll crank that up slightly. We'll go up to 90 just to show that what happens as you increase this higher and higher, you'll be using less and less frames. And then you need to set some alignment points. And you can do this automatically by just simply clicking on this button here and it'll pick out a whole heap of obvious alignment points for you to use. So the next step is we'll go through and start the alignment process. So it'll, it'll actually pick out, yeah, it'll actually pick out the best frames. So we'll just let it chug away for a little while as it's, as it's going. And maybe whilst that's running in the background, let's see, is it still, okay, it's done its job. Um, you can see what it's done here, it's picked the best frame, it found that number 165 is going to be the reference frame and normally what it does, it picks something in the middle because it figures if there was any movement that's probably about the average 
and it's chosen 167 frames out of the 333. So it's thrown, we've thrown away half the frames. And then if we click on limit, it'll actually limit the processing to that many frames. And then the next job is to stack those frames. So now what it's going to do is stack each one of those 167 frames, one on top of each other, to, to form an average of the image with less noise. So I'll just run that. We'll see how long it takes. And then once that's finished, we can move to the next step of the actual processing. Here we go. So it's, it's done the stacking. And then now we can move to the wavelet uh, section of, of Registax. Now this is where, where some little bit of magic happens with the signal processing. So what you've got here, um, in this section here are six layers. The topmost layer has the finest features in it of the image. And as you move down, we lower the frequency of the filtering and we end up with some lower frequency images. So, and you can, you can get an idea of what we're talking about. If I click on here, these are all the different images that it's picked out. If we go down to the lowest one, the, 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 this effect is a little bit subtle, but you, you start to notice the features are getting a little bit larger. We can accentuate this further by, probably this shows it a bit better, there's two types of wavelet schemes it uses, and the, these two different schemes just use different types of filtering. This filtering here is more extreme, so if we go from the, the top, these are the fine features, we've moved to the bottom, what we find here are some broader features, so these are much lower frequency. Now, the idea is, and I'll move back to the default linear, the idea is that we start moving these sliders around. So, if you really don't know what's going on, just give it a shot, just move it up to here and watch what happens. It starts to enhance those features that that layer is controlling. And you can move through each one and just play around with it and just see, you know, if you go too far, it's going to become obvious. If I move this to the end here, that's, that's going a bit overboard. So what, because this first layer will also contain most of the noise, you don't want to go overboard with it. So it's a bit of trial and error because each image will behave differently. Um, and then you just move through and play around with them. And what happens is you end up with a nice, sharper image where you can start to see some really good detail. And once you've done that, there's a whole heap of nice image processing tools. Some of these people who use Photoshop or other uh, imaging processing tools will, will note. You know, there's a gamma factor that you can use. Um, this is quite handy because what, what the gamma You've probably heard of gamma corrected images. That's what most cameras do. And what that means is on a, on a CCD chip, when you get twice as much photons coming in, you get twice the signal. But your eye doesn't work that way. Okay? Your eye is more sensitive to signals down at the darker end of the light intensity than it is at the, the higher end. So what you can do is actually start, you know, you can put a few points on here and start moving this around, say, oh, I'll accentuate these ones a bit more than this, and start playing with it, and you can, you can start uh, enhancing the image. That might not be right, so you might want to change, make it a bit more non-linear, and approach something more like what the eye might be capable of, of doing. Um, losing the spot there. So you can see you can enhance different uh, intensity levels in a different way. Just quickly, another, another nice uh, feature is this one, which when, you've, when you're imaging in colour, as most people who do astrophotography will know, the optics will focus blue light slightly differently to red light. So what happens, you won't see it so much in the moon picture, 
although you can see a little bit of blue edging on there, you can just click the automatic estimate and what the software does, it tries to align the, the red and the blue better because of the dispersion effect that you get. Um, because focusing different wavelengths, they won't focus on the exact same spot. That's just the way, uh, unless you're using special optics. So that'll run through for a while and I'll just let it go. And you'll find here it may shift the, the red and, and the blue in the XY positions on the image to try and uh, correct it. Now I've only got 10 minutes left so just to finish off I thought I was hoping to have an internet connection but I don't but just as a backup I've tried to um, put some of my better uh, astrophoto shots that was that same image we were just looking at um, here's another one of the moon so it's you can see that the focus wasn't perfect so sometimes you can go back and, and it's, it's a bit of trial and error and try and work out how to adjust your equipment next time you do it. I'm not sure what happened to the colour there, I seem to get a different colour on that day. Um, so Moon is quite a nice one to start with. This is an early one of Jupiter where I got it, um, a good uh, reproduction of the, of the spot there and that was using the Phillips. 640 by 480, so that's not too bad. But then when I moved to um, the CMOS higher res webcam, the high res allowed me to get some more detail. So this one here is, I think it's from memory, EO and Europa um, around Jupiter. So that timing was good to get that, that one. Um, some other stuff you can do. Here's another one. Um, I think we've got Again, EO and Europa. Um, that, that one's sitting out there by itself, but you can also see a shadow on Jupiter, which in fact, when I went back with Starry Night to check, there's actually a moon right here, right next to that spot, which didn't quite come up in this image, but you can sort of see it if you look carefully, and that's casting a shadow on, that, uh, on Jupiter. So I'll just go through this. Here's another one of Saturn and Titan. So it is possible to get some, when the conditions are good, to, to get some of the moons of the bigger planets. I uh, also tried my hand at the Mercury transit a few years ago. So that's actually Merc Mercury there transiting the sun. So and that was using the Coronado uh, Solar Telescope. Now, just, just to finish off, I thought, Okay, I've gone as far as, you know, I've spent many years doing the planets and, and I've got a website which I'll, I'll tell you at the end if you want to look at more. Um, I thought let's try deep sky imaging. So obviously now the challenges ramp up because obviously light pollution limits magnitude and targets. You can forget about long exposures. Um, and I'm going to need some better cameras. The webcam because it's not cooled, you can't keep the noise levels down low enough for the longer exposures. You may need filters, but you need very accurate alignment, stable mount. The mount I've got is not the best, but you can do some deep sky. And you need accurate tracking, and that's where the auto guiding come in. So it means additional camera, additional guiding scope, which is usually just a small refractor. And if you choose the right target, it's possible, but then I ran into another snag. Because I've got the LXD55, um, it doesn't have an ST4 auto guiding port on it because it's so old. It's got an auxiliary serial port. And I did some research and they said, oh, you need this APM909 module. And uh, snag number two, that's a discontinued product. So I thought, oh, that's, that, that's the end of that. You're going to have to get a new telescope. But then speaking to a, a couple of uh, telescope shop owners, they said, why don't you go to this website? Um, the guy's name is Gene Nolan. I'm not getting any royalties for him or anything, but he decided to make a clone of this module and has, and has also got a few other nice accessories like a USB interface that I can connect to that and use the PhD guiding software 
Um, and he, he also supplies a Bluetooth interface to an Android device if you want to control it from a phone. Uh, you don't really need this uh, Bluetooth stuff, but by putting all these together, I was able to, my first attempt was, um, okay, using this, the setup, so it's, that's looking up pretty high, and you can see the rail across there, so I've got them side by side, that's the auto-guiding um, part of the telescope. That can be a webcam, this uh, auto-guiding camera, it doesn't have to be expensive. And I decided to use my DSLR camera. Um, I've since then basically inserted directly into the back of the tube because the, uh, I think the, uh, the prism just fell apart from the weight one night. So you got, weight is a big issue when you start mounting all these things on. And just to look at my first attempt, probably pretty uh, beginner stuff, I guess, um, but I was, I was excited by this one because I mean all the bits I plugged into the, into the telescope, all these modules and stuff, actually worked. So fairly short exposure in terms of deep sky, but I was able to get some reasonably nice round stars there. So I thought, oh, that's a good start. That's the Orion Nebula, obviously. Um, and there's some of, and I did do some dark correction, but there's no filters. I mean, you, you can go ahead and, and improve the response and also because those stars are so bright compared to the the nebula what people tend to do is a bit of processing where you can mask those out bring this out more and then recombine them to get a, a better balance between those really bright stars and then around the same time Eta Carina was high up in the sky and I thought why don't I try that one and this was, I guess, my second uh, success in terms of uh, deep sky where I got um, the Keyhole Nebula. This is a two minute exposure, so I was still playing around with the auto guiding in, in, in the PhD software it's called for trying to um, keep the guiding on track. I managed to get up to three minutes at one point, but I'm still playing. There's so many parameters you've got to play with. Um, but I thought that was a reasonable, um, there's a little bit of drift there. You can see those stars are starting to look a bit blobby there. Um, if you've got perfect uh, guiding, they, they should be fairly round. Um, the blobbiness to me seems to be less on one side than the other. So I'm even wondering whether the plane of my camera was completely um, parallel to the, I guess, the plane of the sky. There may have been some misalignment there. So I guess, you know, the message is yes, you might, you might live in the suburbs and you have to deal with all these you know, uh, challenges in terms of observing, but it is possible to actually do some good imaging uh, with, the, with the right equipment and right approach. And just there's a few um, uh, references you know, for Registax. I found it difficult to get really in depth info on Registax, but there's stuff scattered around. There's a couple of texts, and I believe Barry's also going to talk about one or two more texts about webcam astrophotography that are going to the library. Uh, you can just Google Registax to, to see the software. Um, and I haven't got my website up there, but it's uh, jimk.net.au is my website where I've tried to keep you know, my, my best photos, I guess, for anyone who's interested. But I'll try and put more of them into the uh, gallery of the ASV as well. So that, that's about it. Thanks.